Okay, so um, I, I want to welcome you all here. I'm really glad that you took the time to join us. Um, these are crazy times, of course, that we're living in. And it's, as I said, it's, it's so important for us to come together uh, as a community to support each other and share resources and ideas. And I wanted to really focus this today on this webinar, not so much on, you know, information and updates about COVID and you know, transmission and how to protect yourselves from uh, acquiring the, the illness and all the things that I have been talking about and are, are very important. But I wanted to spend more time today talking about how we can adapt to living with this reality, because without a doubt, our, all of our realities have changed, um, you know, perhaps some more than others, but there's no doubt that life is going to look very different in the coming months. And while no one has a crystal ball, we don't know exactly how things are going to unfold. It's pretty safe to say that um, there, we're all gonna have to make changes and we're all gonna have to learn to live with circumstances that are not of our choosing and may be challenging in many different ways. Intensity, confusion, uncertainty are, uh, really characterizing life right now and seem to be growing every day and we're starting to feel the impacts of this more directly in terms of um, the impacts on health care on our economy and on our social systems this is a deep and widespread crisis it's unlike anything that most of us face on a day-to-day -day basis and, and probably unlike anything that most people face in a lifetime so we're being called forth to rise to this challenge and the good news is that i believe we are all equal to it i believe that we can meet this challenge and overcome it and we can actually even learn to uh, make positive changes as a result of, uh, of of the challenges that we're facing with covid so there's a great quote from andy grove who is the ceo of intel and, and he it, it applied he was talking about it in the context of companies. He said, mediocre companies are destroyed by crises. Um, good companies survive them and great companies are improved by them. So I think that's very relevant today. If we apply that to our, us as individuals and uh, as local communities, as nations, and even as a, as a global community at large, we have the opportunity to allow ourselves to be improved by this crisis and i'm not just talking about uh, ways that our own lives can improve but things that ways that we can transform society and address some of the issues that have been um, very thorny and difficult for us to make progress on i think covid is going to provide uh, cover shall we say for us to actually start um, making some real progress with these issues because um, because people, we're gonna have a chance to approach things with a much more open mind and a different perspective than we ever have. But if, if we wanna do this, we have to adapt. And uh, many years ago when I, when I first launched the ADAPT Practitioner Training Program and chose the name ADAPT, uh, it was clear to me even then that modern life uh, was, was not, um, let's say not very conducive to optimal health and that we were gonna to have to increasingly learn how to adapt to this modern world that we're living in in order to uh, cultivate more resilience, optimize our health and, and uh, create more joy in our lives. And COVID is certainly the most pressing and glaring recent example of that. But there are many other examples just in our day-to-day -day lives of how we need to adapt and grow and evolve. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. To do this, we have to consciously develop both internal and external resources. And there's a concept in the positive psychology li literature called psychological capital or PSYCAP. I don't love that term. It's, it's a little bit uh, uh, too far into the realm of neoliberalism and, and uh, too, too much focus on capital, I think, but let's just call it, let's use it for now. And um, it consists of four 
capacities that are encapsulated by the acronym HERO. So H is for hope, E is for eff efficacy, R is for resilience, and O is for optimism. So HERO. So these are the capacities that we really need to develop in order to make it through a crisis like this. And uh, I'm going to share today a five point plan for developing hero or psychological capital or capacity. And I brought in uh, faculty members from ADAPT and also some ADAPT certified functional health coaches to share their insight and experience. And I'm going to uh, talk for maybe about 45 minutes or an hour, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So let's just dive in. The first um, practice or capacity that's absolutely critical for developing HERO is a mindfulness or meditation practice. So this can help us stay present and not be consumed by our thoughts and feelings, uh, which can really get out of control in situations like this. It helps us develop the capacity to witness our habitual responses and to choose new ones that might be more appropriate and more effective. It helps us to reduce stress and overwhelm. It improves our efficacy, which is the E <clears throat> in HERO and is what allows for more effective action. And there are many different ways to, uh, to dive into meditation and mindfulness if you haven't already. There are apps like Calm and Headspace, 10% uh, Happier, and they're all useful. That said, uh, I have always believed that the, the best way to learn anything is to have um, guided instruction. And that's as true of meditation and mindfulness as it is of any other new skill or capacity. Um, so we have that for you today with um, Forrest Fine, who is a faculty member uh, in the ADAPT Health Coach Training Program, and I'll introduce him shortly. But first, I want to turn it over to Lini Hoffman, who's an ADAPT Certified Functional Health Coach, to talk a little bit about how uh, a, developing a mindfulness practice uh, was transformative for her. So Lini, welcome. Hi. Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I do want to say that I am so grateful for Forrest Fine and his instruction. Uh, I always wanted a, a mindfulness practice, and I had always heard about the benefits of having one, but I never really made it a priority because I was, um, I was too busy, or I wasn't quite sure if it was worth the effort to, to put into it, or uh, I wasn't quite sure even how to do it. And because it was part of our ADAPT health coaching program, I had a, a, a wonderful opportunity to, to learn all about mindfulness. But I also realized that I did actually have the time and that it was worth the effort. And you don't have to know everything about mindfulness to practice it. And you, you kind of learn as you go. And I also like to say that you learn as you grow. And growth is the operative word here because I feel like I've grown in my capacity just to pay attention to the normal everyday things that happen in life. And for me, meditation is just about exploring and getting really curious about what you are experiencing in the present moment without judgment. And there's different things that we can explore. We can explore um, our sensation, like me just sitting in this chair or hearing a dog barking in the background. I can experience my emotions. Um, am I scared right now? Am I nervous? Am I um, worried? And I can feel what that, that those feelings feel like in my body. I can experience happiness. Um, and then you can also explore your thoughts. You know, we often have this thought loop that's uh, on, on just consistently playing, you know, how long is this, this situation going to last? What am I going to make for dinner? I got to throw in a load of laundry, you know, just, just that perpetual thought loop. And I'm, I'm, this mindfulness practice 
has allowed me to notice how I react and relate to things like discomfort or pleasure or thought patterns, um, these habitual behaviors. So I, I feel like it's paying attention on purpose. And when we're not paying attention, um, we, I feel like we train ourselves to react habitually to what's happening moment by moment. And we just go on autopilot. And, you know, like an example of that would be after listening to a 24 hour news cycle, you know, just kind of mindlessly walking to the cabinet and grabbing the cookies or lashing out at, at my husband when deep inside, I'm really just scared. Um, stocking up on toilet paper because <laughs> that is, uh, that's your way of control. Um, and I feel like we've, without mindfulness, you miss out on really beautiful opportunities because you're on autopilot. Maybe a conversation with my daughter in the kitchen because I, you know, I might miss out on that because I'm doing five other things. Um, with mindfulness, I feel like we can respond rather than react. And what I've noticed personally about starting my mindfulness practice and being consistent with it is that I know that when I stop, focus on my breath, that I'm going to experience this sensation of just relax and, and almost relief sometimes. Um, I, I start to get more in tune with sensations in my body and I can ask myself, what do I need in this moment? Um, I'm a better listener. I'm able to disengage from some of those perpetual worrisome thoughts. And I, I feel good that I have a say in how I respond instead of reacting. And especially in our situation today, I can be mindful of my current health that right now I can breathe in and feel that breath and feel okay with it. And, um, I can, I can experience and acknowledge fear and how it pertains to what's going on right now. And what is, get curious about what my relationship is to that fear and sit with it and be okay with it. And, um, and then I can also notice the little spring flowers that are popping up um, right outside my front door. Uh, I like to compare it to almost like the Wizard of Oz. So in the beginning, Dorothy was in um, Kansas and it was black and white. And then she uh, landed in Munchkin land and it was Technicolor. Um, I feel like that's how with cultivating this mindfulness practice, I'm able to see things in Technicolor when Technicolor has been here all along. Um, I feel like I'm relating better to what's happening as it is with less resistance and I don't have to wait for things to be perfect, that we can experience life as it is in this set of circumstances. And uh, it just allows us to find the extraordinary in the ordinary. Thank you so much, Nini. It was really... Um... Interesting to hear about your process with this and how it has changed you and, and your relationships. And really, it sounds like your entire perspective and experience of life, which has been my experience as well. Yeah. Um, I wanted to let everybody know, I forgot to mention this. My, our team has developed a um, COVID adapting guide with lots of resources and links uh, that are related to a lot of the things we're going to be talking about today. So if you miss, you know, any resource or anything that anybody mentions, don't worry, we're going to send out that full guide tomorrow and we'll be updating it as we go. Um, so, so just uh, feel free to kind of sit back and relax and watch. You don't need to worry too much about writing anything down. So I want to turn it over to Forrest next. And uh, before I do that, I just want to mention that it's always been a core part of our training and education philosophy uh, that information is not enough to change behavior and that in, to really learn something new, you have to practice it and experience it firsthand. And so, uh, you know, just telling you that meditation and mindfulness is, is helpful is one thing, 
but actually providing resources and support um, and even allowing you to experience it firsthand is another. And that's what we're gonna do a little bit of today. It might seem strange to do that on a webinar with almost a thousand people on it and not being in the same room. But I think it's really important just to give yourself the opportunity. I would invite you to, even if this is foreign and strange and something you've never done before, just to, you know, allow a few minutes to try something new and, and just keep an open mind and see how it feels. So I'm going to turn it over to Forrest Fine, who's a faculty member in the ADAPT Health Coach Training Program. He uh, leads the mindfulness track in the Health Coach Training Program, and he's going to share a little bit uh, about meditation and, and, and take us through a guided practice. Okay. Um, all right. So hello, everyone. And um, I want to begin by just acknowledging that um, a regular mindfulness practice allows us to uh, develop and train the mind so that regardless of our outer circumstances, regardless of if we're facing uh, challenges or if life is feeling chaotic, that we can experience a sense of inner peace, uh, a sense of inner well-being, um, a kind of inner spaciousness, regardless of our outer circumstances. So uh, as Chris was saying, if you're new to this practice, keep an open mind. Um, one thing that's important to, uh, to know right out of the gate is you cannot do this practice wrong. Okay, this is just a willingness to be with your moment to moment experience, regardless of what it is that you're experiencing. And I'll be guiding you through it. So this will be about a seven or eight minute uh, embodied mindfulness practice. All right. So uh, to begin, I wanna invite you to uh, find a comfortable position, okay? I imagine most people will be doing this practice seated, but you're also welcome to do this practice standing or lying down. Um, if you're seated, uh, invite you to bring your hands uh, to your thighs or in your lap. And if it's comfortable having the feet <clears throat> flat on the floor. Uh, the eyes can be open or closed. Um, if the eyes are open, um, I invite you to have a soft gaze, maybe looking down at your hands. This can help to ground you. And to begin, uh, just inviting everyone to start by taking a couple of slow, smooth, deep breaths. So in through the nose, slow, smooth, deep. Filling your belly, filling your chest. And then out through the mouth. Let's do a couple more. Slow, smooth, deep inhale through the nose. And a slow, smooth, deep exhale through the mouth. And one more deep inhale. And a smooth exhale. All right. And as you come back to your natural breathing, just invite you to take a moment and, and notice where you may be holding any unnecessary tension in the, in the body, in the face, and just allowing the face to soften, your jaw to soften, uh, your shoulders, your belly, your lower back. And now taking a moment and tuning into the sounds around you. and noticing what you hear. So the sound of my voice. You can notice sound and the space in between the sounds. And as you sit here breathing in and breathing out, just notice how you can listen, not only with your ears, but with your, your whole body. So there's no need to effort or strain, just allowing the sounds to come to you. And as you sit here breathing in and breathing out, sensing the space in the room around you. And 
the space above you and the vast sky beyond that. Vast, spacious sky. Okay, and as you sit here breathing in and breathing out, just invite you to drop your attention down into your body and feel the support of the ground beneath you. The support of the ground beneath you, feeling gravity, feeling the feet making contact with the ground, the body making contact with the, the chair if you're seated. And as you sit here breathing in and breathing out, the sensation of your clothing touching your skin, sensation of your clothing touching your skin, So now I want to invite you to become aware of the movement of the breath in the body. The movement of the breath in the body. Notice how the belly and chest rise on the inhale and fall on the exhale. The belly and chest rise on the inhale and fall on the exhale. And if at any point you get distracted, you get pulled into thought, just know that's not a problem. It's part of the practice. You're doing it right. And you just simply come back to the breath and the feelings and sensations in the body. Maybe noticing the feeling of your heart beating in your chest, pumping blood throughout your body. The feelings and sensations in the arms and the hands, your fingers, your thumbs. And noticing if the hands feel warm or cool. And then as we come into the end of this embodied mindfulness practice, I invite you to become aware of the feeling of your tongue in your mouth. Sensation of the lips touching. The tingling sensation of the breath inside the nostrils. As you sit here breathing in and breathing out. And then finally, the feelings and sensations from the top of your head to the tips of your toes your whole body uh, sitting here breathing. Okay, and we'll close with a, a very short kindness practice. So the invitation is I'll offer you some simple phrases and just repeating these phrases silently to yourself. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be peaceful and at ease. May my friends and family be peaceful and at ease. May my friends and family be peaceful and at ease. And finally, may everyone everywhere, may everyone everywhere be peaceful and at ease. 
May everyone everywhere be peaceful and at ease. And remember to breathe. And in these last moments, just allowing yourself to breathe and feel whatever it is that you're feeling. As we share this human experience together of being alive on this planet at this time. Mm -hmm. Knowing and trusting that we have everything that it takes to make it through this time and emerge stronger, healthier, happier, more compassionate and wise human beings. Okay, as you're ready, if the eyes are closed, just inviting you to open the eyes and staying connected with the, the breath in the body. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Forrest. And I just wanna take a moment to invite all of you who participated, especially those of you who are totally new to mindfulness and meditation to just appreciate yourselves for taking the the risk of doing that it you know it's it's sometimes threatening and challenging to try something new like that and so i hope you are uh, were able to to do it and get a sense of how important it is to cultivate this witness perspective this capacity to witness what's happening in 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 our bodies and our minds and and around us and that gives us a chance of escaping this cycle of reactivity that, that we can all so easily get stuck in. And that's, I think, a critical skill to develop in times like, times like this, in any time, frankly, but in times like this, it's even more obvious. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the next um, capacity or, or uh, uh, skill that we need to develop in order to build this psychological capacity. And this is, uh, what we can call cultivating re realistic optimism and hope. So what is realistic optimism? Well, in a crisis like this, I do think that it's important for us to explore and prepare for worst case scenarios. Uh, that's just being clear headed about where we are at this moment in time. I think, you know, putting your head in the sand and pretending that everything's just going to be fine. Uh, is maybe a bit of denial. I think things will be fine, that things will turn, turn out. Uh, we're gonna make it through this and we'll, we'll probably make it through this stronger than before, but that doesn't mean there won't be significant impacts uh, socially, economically, and to our health and well-being. And so I think it makes sense to prepare for those and explore what those might be. That's just um, wise and effective action. At the same time, if we spend all of our waking moments thinking about worst case scenarios, we are going to become paralyzed and overwhelmed. And that will actually decrease our ability to respond in an appropriate way. So we have to balance the uh, realistic preparation and exploration of worst case scenarios with exploration of bright spots, upsides, opportunities, blessings, and and other positive things that could come out of the experience of living with COVID. So if you have pen and paper nearby or you're by a computer where you can write a few things down, uh, take out some paper and a pen or just jot down some answers to these questions about living through COVID. So number one is what new learning and, or skills could you develop? in the next few months or, or might COVID spur you to develop? And you can finish these later. I'll just give you a moment or two for each question. What new learning and skills could COVID spur you to develop? The next question is, what shifts in mindset and behaviors might come from this experience? Many of you maybe had your first actual experience with mindfulness and meditation right now, so that could be one. But what other shifts in mindset and new behaviors that could support you uh, might come out of this experience? 
And then the third question is what changes that you haven't been able to make so far because life has gotten in the way, might you actually be able to make now because of COVID? Either because you're sheltering in place or because you're thinking about things in a different way or you, you're getting certain kind of support that you weren't getting before. What changes might you be able to make now that you haven't been able to make successfully so far because of COVID? I don't believe that everything happens for a reason, but I do believe that when things happen, we have a choice in how we respond. And I, my own personal experience dealing with a very severe complex chronic illness for many, many years has taught me that in every crisis, including ones that seem like there couldn't possibly be anything that would be good that could come out of it, uh, there are opportunities for growth and evolution. And I think that's where we are today. So I wanna turn it over now to Eric Ho, who is a graduate from of the ADAPT Health Coach Training Program and an ADAPT Certified Functional Health Coach. And he's gonna share some of his strategies for cultivating realistic optimism and hope. Thanks, Chris. And as you say, it's important uh, to make time for those bright spots. So what I wanna share with everyone today are two effective strategies for bringing optimism and hope into your life at a time when it feels almost impossible to envisage it. Um, and I've used these with, with good success with clients and friends and family. Um, and I'll be honest here, I didn't think these worked before I tried them. I'm, I'm very much a rational person and I was a skeptic, but I'd encourage people listening and watching to experiment and have faith and try because you never know how uh, you might surprise yourself. But what I know I, that doesn't work is I've heard people say, keep calm and carry on. Um, you don't have to, the time to worry. It'll all work out eventually, or we've experienced worse before. In fact, these don't shift your mind from a place of optimism and hope. They come from a good place, often from kindness and care, but in reality, they aren't very helpful. And so in times of stress and anxiety, these are the key moments to focus on you and your self-care, like the wonderful examples Lini and Forrest have shared with us from a mindfulness perspective. So I wanna share this concept with you today of crowding out your anxiety and worry. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, our ancient brains, our limbic brains that keep us in survival mode are really good at keeping our minds thinking about dire circumstances, keeping our attention tuned to the news feeds that are filled with bad news. But as human beings, as, as Chris mentioned, we have the capacity to choose how to respond to those feelings of anxiety and worry. And we can actually take steps to activate or rest, relax, digest part of our nervous system, the one that allows us to be calm and focused. And we can do that by focusing what is positive and what is good amongst all of this bad news. And the more we focus on the positive and good around us, however small, however seemingly insignificant, the less our survival mode brains have time to think about that doom and gloom. And so we end up crowding out our anxieties and worries. So it's important to be realistic here. Um, I'm not advocating for sugarcoating the situation we find ourselves in. You know, crowding out isn't about um, these uh, you know, negative feelings and calling everything positive. That would be unrealistic. And I'm, I'm not also saying that we ignore or suppress the emotions of anxiety or worry because those feelings will bubble away because we're human beings. The point is how we choose to respond to them. So let's talk about these two strategies. The first I'm gonna share with you is gratitude journaling. So you can crowd out your negative thoughts by writing down what you're grateful for. And there are plenty of resources available, uh, apps like Reflectly, Happier, ThinkUp. Um, if you're a pen and paper person, there's the five minute journal, which is a good resource. Um, or you might use your diary or simply a scrap of paper. And what you can be grateful for can be really simple. So here's what you do. Start your day or end it by writing down in your chosen journal what you are grateful for. Um, I caught myself looking at some videos online showing the plight of um, individuals in intensive care in Italy and some medical professionals who are battling to save those people. And rather than worry about those emotionally challenging moments, I actually wrote down what I was grateful for. And I wrote that I was grateful for being alive and breathing air. 
Um, so I said I was a skeptic before, um, but science shows this works. And you know, as Chris will know, in 2016, there was a pilot study of patients who had heart failure. And the patient group who did gratitude journaling saw a decrease in the inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein and an increase in the heart rate variability that corresponds to a decrease in the stress response. So I invite our audience to ask themselves, what am I grateful for today? And write it down. The other one is to express appreciation, uh, to crowd out your anxieties and worries and tell someone why you value them, why you appreciate them. So you might call out their strengths, uh, their positive qualities, their achievements. Um, to someone who's looking out uh, for you, looking after you, you might say, you've been really kind to me. Um, perhaps to our medics, you might say, you've been really brave in doing your job um, in extraordinary circumstances and putting your own health at risk. If you're not ex uh, used to expressing your appreciation, it might feel awkward. Um, and having grown up on, the, on this side of the pond, we're a little more reserved than you folks in the US, but it certainly wasn't something that came to me naturally. But the wonderful thing I find about giving appreciation is that not only does the recipient feel good, but you feel good too. And that instant feedback you get, the, the smile on someone's face is magical. And giving appreciation is as good as getting. So I've got a section in my digital notebook where I've collated all the instances that someone's given me some appreciation for what I do for them. Um, and why do I do that? Well, it's a place for me to gather those thoughts and to reflect and appreciate my own strengths and qualities and achievements. And so when we're in the midst of ruminating about this world coming to an end, even when it isn't, it's really difficult to shift your attention away from bad news and events. So I pick up my appreciation journal in these moments and it's another tool to allow me to reframe, reduce my worry and crowd out that anxiety and negativity. So again, to our audience, I encourage you, whenever you receive an appreciation, some recognition or some positive feedback that feels meaningful to you, to take a moment to jot it down and come back to it to crowd out your anxiety and worry. Thank you so much, Eric, for that sharing. Um, I'm a big believer in gratitude journaling. Um, like you, Eric, I tend to be a bit of a rationalist in, in, some, in some cases at least. And um, although I could see the value of gratitude journaling, it took reading the scientific literature and seeing the massive impact that it can have, not just on our mental health and well-being, but as Eric pointed out, actually on, on real physiological conditions like heart disease, uh, diabetes, uh, chronic pain, um, and all kinds of different chronic illnesses. And it's a critical, critical part of building realistic op optimism. Uh, and I think it's a really important part of the next strategy that I'm going to talk about, which is elevating your mood. So many of us are probably stuck for a large part of the day and maybe even during the night in a fight or flight response. As many of you know, that's the, the, the default reaction that human beings have to stressful events, uh, whether they're life threatening or not. And when we're in that fight or flight response, our bodies are prioritizing only what's needed for short term survival. You know, our, our heart starts pumping more rapidly, we, we're breathing more rapidly, blood flows going to our skeletal muscles. Uh, but it's going away from the systems that are really critical for longer term health, like a, a, a digestive system, our endocrine system, uh, reproductive hormones. And uh, we feel the impacts of that in so many different ways, both in terms of our mental health and just our physical well being. It affects everything from our sleep to our immune function, which is, of course, critical right now, to our digestion, to our mood and mental health. So we need to take conscious and intentional action to turn off the fight or flight response and get into what scientists call the rest and digest response. This is of course the other side of the um, nervous system coin, if you will, from the fight or flight response. <clears throat> and it's the parasympathetic response where we uh, settle into that kind of default relaxed place. Um, in times of crisis, it's, it's difficult to to get there and to stay there without taking really intentional action and doing things that we know 
will shift us out of the fight or flight response and get us into that rest and digest response. So some of the easiest ways to do that, I mean, mindfulness will do that. We've already talked about that. I think gratitude uh, does that and, and appreciation. But I want to talk more specifically uh, in this third strategy about pleasure, joy, laughter, and fun. These are all the antidote to the stress response. And in fact, when you're in states of pleasure or joy, um, you're having fun and you're laughing, chemicals are being released in your body that are antithetical to that fight or flight response. That They literally turn off the stress response, they lower cortisol levels. These endorphins that we produce uh, have the opposite impact that, that cortisol and other stress hormones have. And so they can, in a very real way, take us out of that stress response. So it, again, it's, it, there's an irony to all of these practices that we're talking about, which is the times when we need them most are also the times when we're least likely to engage in them consistently. <laughs> So it requires a commitment and like I, I've said, an intentional act to, to uh, bring these practices into our life. I actually recommend scheduling them into your calendar um, like you would any other appointment, uh, important appointment or event so that you make sure you're, you have time for that and don't just let any free time that you might have get sucked up by you know, reading the news or um, you, you know, just doing something on the internet that's not supporting you in that same way. So uh, with this in mind, um, if you have that same piece of paper or document you're working on the computer, you don't have to finish this now, but I recommend making a list of all of the things that bring you joy or pleasure or things that make you laugh or, or uh, things that are fun for you. It might sound silly to do this. We think, of, of course, we know what those things are, but when we're stuck in the fight or flight response, it can be very difficult to access that part of our brain that knows how to uh, laugh and how, and, and how to seek pleasure or joy. So having a list and, and putting it somewhere prominent, you know, in your office or your, on your refrigerator, that you can look at it on a regular basis and just pick one or two things from that list to do on a daily basis is, is, can be a really powerful intervention. So of course, this will vary from person to person. Um, some examples could include listening to music that you love that's really uplifting and joyful. Singing, using our voice is a really powerful way of, uh, of connecting with that part of ourselves. Watching funny movies or, or TV, engaging in a hobby that you love already or learning a new hobby or skill, playing with your kids or a pet, spending time in nature, uh, taking a hot bath, giving or receiving a massage with people that you're sheltering in place with. And, you know, of course, uh, not going out to get a massage right now, um, but practicing uh, social distancing. But if you're already sheltering in place with someone um, that you can do that with, it's great. And then playing games, uh, again, with either with people that you're sheltering in place with, or um, there are online games that you can play, board games um, that you can play with other people that you don't know. You can also set up Zoom calls like this and play with friends and family members. Um, I've heard of uh, some great online karaoke stuff happening. Uh, we're going to have a whole bunch of links and resources in the guide that we send out with ideas for how to do this. Uh, any of the panelists, if anything else that I haven't mentioned that, that uh, satisfies this for you, that's fun, joy, laughter, uh, that helps you get out get out of fight or flight and get into that rest and digest state. Okay, so dancing, seeing one of the, um, that's one of my favorites. I can't believe I left that off the list. And um, there are actually some uh, dance studios around the country in the US that are offering free dance classes. Uh, YouTube, of course, is your friend. There's tons and tons of free dance stuff that's happening on YouTube. There's great um, kids exercise and dance stuff that you can do with your kids, which is really fun. So um, yes, Erica. Uh, one thing that I know has been helpful for me during this time is there are a lot of, sure there are a lot of um, parts of the internet that are not helpful with keeping our stress down, but engaging with the parts of the internet that 
make us laugh is has been important to me so this is the time for all of those funny animal videos to shine um to keep us just feeling good and and, and giggling along the way there's a, a video of of a dog running into a pile of leaves over and over again and pure uninhibited joy of the dog it's just translating into me every time i watch it so this is a good time for for just sharing even those kinds of little joyful uh videos and funny memes absolutely thank you and keep an eye on the chat box a lot of folks around the world are sharing uh their ideas and what works for them i'm seeing some great ones um so yeah there's a lot that we can do and i think the main point is that uh, just to keep in mind that our tendency when we get into the fight or flight response is not to do these other things. We think, how can we do that at a time like this when there's so much suffering in the world and uh, I, I need to be constantly vigilant and constantly checking the news so I'm informed and I can stay ahead of this. And again, while I, while I, when I talked about realistic optimism, I, I, I do think it's important to be informed and prepared. But we have to ha spend at least half of our time, I would say, cultivating joy and, and, and laughing and cultivating hope and optimism because that's um, not only gonna make life bearable, it's gonna make our response so much more effective. So the next uh, strategy that I wanna talk about, number four, is connecting with loved ones and getting support. Uh, human beings are tribal social creatures and I think Clearly, one of the most challenging aspects of COVID is, is going to be sheltering in place. And the reality is that that is likely going to happen for uh, months and not weeks. So we need to be prepared for that and find uh, other creative ways of, of satisfying that need for social connection, um, even if you're sheltering in place or if you're, if you're completely isolated, for example, if you have acquired COVID or think you may have and you're taking even stricter measures. So here are a few ideas and then I'm going to turn turn it over to Erica Evans who's also an ADAPT certified ADAPT functional health coach and graduate of the program to to share some of her perspective on this and some resources. So you can FaceTime or Skype you know video chat with a friend or a family member. Uh, with my family we're actually setting up the group Zoom calls like this so we can get the entire family together for a bit of a virtual family reunion, and that's really fun. Um, Zoom is really easy to use, as you can see, and uh, I think they have uh, either free um, offering or, or you know, certainly very low cost offerings that you can use to connect. Uh, you can write emails or texts to people reminding them that you love them and care about them and are thinking of them. Just a short message can go a really long way to help people feel like they're not alone. Um, you can join local community organizations that are gathering online. So Nextdoor is a good resource for that if, if that's available in your community. Here where I live, um, where our local neighborhood is organizing to help more vulnerable and at-risk people in our neighborhood. And you know, I see a lot of phenomenal examples of communities coming together. Um, crisis can really bring out the best of humanity and so this is an opportunity to connect with other people um, not just your friends and family but in your local community in your neighborhood uh, you can have a virtual happy hour with friends doesn't have to include alcohol could be a kombucha party or you know whatever works for you um, but just getting together and having uh, some social time where maybe you even try not to talk too much about uh, COVID, it's hard to avoid it entirely, but just have some opportunity to connect and enjoy each other's company. Um, playing games online with friends and family. There's some services like Tabletopia, Pogo, MindGames.com. I mentioned quarantine karaoke in, in the last point. Uh, taking a walk outdoors with friends and family members, practicing adequate social distancing and following the, the right precautions there, of course. And then reaching out to ask for help when you need it. That's another really critical uh, aspect of this is that well, we can't make it through this without each other and without really coming together and supporting each other, whether we're talking about our friends or family, our local communities, we really need to uh, be willing to, to reach out and ask for help when we're struggling and we need it. And that's hard for a lot of us and it doesn't come easily, but 
I want to turn it over to Erica now to talk about some resources for this and why this is so important. Thanks, Chris. So, um, like a lot of folks who are probably listening, um, you know, I began to get wrapped up in the bit of the news cycle and infinite scroll on, on media surrounding COVID-19. And, and while, you know, experiencing what that was doing to me, uh, thinking about a few things. One, you know, that humans are hard, hardwired for connection. Um, this is how we've evolved as a social species. Um, and the other two things that have been sticking out in my mind is service is the rent we pay to live on this planet. And what can I do right now um, to help support anyone who needs it? As an ADAPT certified functional health coach, you know, we and, and my other colleagues on this call, we have a set of skills that can be very valuable um, in, in working through these challenging times for folks whose, whose lives have been disrupted. Uh, and so the, the phrase, you know, time, talent, and treasure came up for me. And I have time and I have talent right now. And, and while I was thinking about all of this, um, uh, a, a colleague of mine, another health coach from the ADAPT program, Sybil Sanchez, uh, asked a group of us a question, you know, is anyone else thinking about how, how great it would be to be able to, to provide support to those affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, a, a network of volunteer health coaches um, who could respond to anyone um, needing some support. Um, and, and this planted a seed for us and inspired our first meeting about a week ago today. Uh, and soon after we, you know, um, flew out the ADAPT bat signal and, and quickly assembled a fantastic group of coach colleagues who are also interested in a project like this. Uh, we've been sort of working tirelessly together to bring what we're calling uh, Health Coaches Without Borders to life. Um, and so this, this network of ADAPT certified functional health coaches, you know, we have been organizing um, primarily because we saw in our own practices with clients we're working with now, how health coaching could make a real impact during these times of social distancing, isolation, heightened fear and stress, where people have real concerns about their health and safety, and they're trying to manage these uprooted routines and lifestyles. Uh, and and what's great about health coaching as a, as a way to support people in need is, um, yes, we have health information, and most importantly, we are change agents. We sit at that intersection of healthy lifestyles and how to do it, that transformative piece. Um, so in what we're putting together in Health Coaches Without Borders, we're looking at uh, what health coaching can provide for people who need it right now during this challenging time. And part of that are some psychosocial benefits through social connection, visioning, empowered support through talking with a coach or even through meeting in a group coaching setting with your peers. Uh, it's also a way to provide reliable information from valid sources. There are a lot of uh, rumors and, and, and maybe um, inaccurate information flying around the internet right now uh, and in the past few weeks about COVID. So we want to be able to provide um, some information when necessary from valid sources. Health coaching can also provide folks during this time with visioning and re-envisioning. So we help our clients to adapt to this new normal and find out how they can be most empowered about their and their family situations. Uh, for, for many, you know, we're experiencing, you know, if we've never worked from home before and now we're working from home, how does anybody do that if you're not used to it? You know, there's, there's no boundaries around work and home and, and all of these things. Or if you've got three kids who are home now and you're trying to figure out how to homeschool them and keep the three times the amount of dishes clean and still do your own job. There are all these uh, disruptions that have, that we have to grapple with at the moment and find ways to adapt to. And then also with health coaching, we can help provide um, strateg strategizing with you and implementing uh, different ways to proactively adapt to the, this new normal, whether it's with creating new habits or finding ways to maintain existing habits. I know I have clients who are like, Erica, I just got my exercise routine down and now I can't go to the gym or, you know, go swimming at the pool. So part of all of this, um, Health Coaches Without Borders, we're, we're coming together, we've come together, this is, say it in the present, we're a weekend, uh, 
to provide a coaching program that is tailored specifically to addressing the needs of people affected during this time. And we're working with a team of volunteer ADAPT certified health coaches who will provide this in both individual and group coaching settings. Um, this initial offering does have limited availability and will pr be provided on a first come first serve basis in the near future. Um, as we figure out the best way to deliver this, this program. And I'm happy to say that Eric and Lini on our call today are, are part of the coaches who are involved in this, in this project. So, you know, creating health, and I think Chris and, and, our, and the other guests on this call have made such a great, uh, have emphasized this so well, creating health and cultivating resilience and joy are perhaps even more necessary now than they ever have been before. And we wanna make ourselves available to help. So if you would like to be notified about when additional details are available uh, for Health Coaches Without Borders uh, and this first offering launches, uh, you can check out, and I'm sure someone, you can put this in the chat, uh, the Health Coaches Without Borders website uh, and sign up for um, the email list to be notified. It's healthcoacheswithoutborders.org. And um, yeah, I, just, I would just like to say, I guess to end that with uh, something Eric mentioned is, is in, um, crowding out the anxiety and worry. This has been my way of dealing with cr crowding out the anxiety and worry. All of the, the news media that was wrapping me in, I thought, how can I be of service? How can I use my time, talent, and treasure right now and come together with others in this like-minded moment? And since we have worked on this project, um, yes, this is all still here and it's serious, but there is so much more hope and optimism for me personally, because I can see this amazing group of people who've come together to offer what they have uh, to help anyone who needs it. Thank you, Erica, for putting this together and offering this service. I think it's uh, amazing and going to be such a big help for people who need that kind of support. So uh, the, the last um, capacity or uh, practice that, that I want to talk about today is being of service. So as I've said throughout the webinar, we're in this together and taking care of each other is the only way we're going to make it through. And there are lots of different ways to do this. I'll just mention a few and folks can chime in in the chat and also um, I'll give guests a chance to do that as well. Uh, I talked about joining a, a neighborhood organization. Uh, here in our neighborhood, we have people mobilizing to do um, shopping and errands for the vulnerable and high-risk populations that are not able to leave their house. Um, we have people that are sewing masks for those people who don't have masks because even fabric masks um, can slow the transmission or, and, and make it less likely that you will acquire the virus. Um, I've, I saw an article about being a pen pal with seniors who are in nursing homes who maybe don't have family or friends that they can connect with. Um, you can donate to your local food bank. You can figure out how to help kids who depend on school lunches and are not able to go to school, make sure that they get that um, necessary sustenance. Uh, anything else from panelists who are on the call uh, that they have been hearing, doing themselves or hearing about in, uh, in terms of ways to serve others. Erica, of course, mentioned if you are a health coach, an ADAPT uh, certified health coach, that's one way, you know, joining Erica's group is one way that you could help. But anything else come to mind or, or anybody on the, um, on the call, just go ahead and type into the chat. Chris, I just want to say, I heard of a... Um, I think Michelle Obama posted it, um, some different ideas. And one of them was doing a Zoom story hour. So maybe you take some time and, and have a Zoom link and, and read to your friend's kids for a little while, something interesting like that. Love that. So we'll, we'll include a roundup of, of resources uh, and ideas for this, but um, this is true in, in even normal times that being of service and having a sense of purpose is uh, like with gratitude, it may seem like it's something hard to quantify, but there actually is good research showing that people who are of service and have that sense of purpose live much longer lifespans than people who don't. Uh, and they enjoy better health and better protection for disease. So not only is this just something that's 
good to do for humanity and, and, you know, for our fellow beings in times like this, it will also help you and make you more resilient and build that psycho psychological capital or capacity. Okay, so that's uh, it for the presentation. I hope you found that to be helpful. Again, we're going to send out a recording tomorrow, as well as the links to the adapting to COVID, uh, uh, the links in the adapting to COVID guide. And then we're going to send out a full transcript of this webinar um, over the, the weekend. So um, I see we have some questions already in the Q&A box, and I'll just uh, dive into some of those. And if you have a question and haven't yet typed it into the Q&A box, go ahead and do that now. Uh, Roxanne asks if cooking is going to destroy, will it destroy the virus? Um, what I've seen is that temperatures uh, of 70 C or about, which is about 160 Fahrenheit for about 30 minutes will definitely destroy the virus. That's actually one way that um, healthcare professionals and others who are using masks are being instructed to sterilize the masks without decreasing their filtration capacity. So if you have a mask like an N95 and you want to reuse it, you could actually put it in the oven um, for about uh, 30 minutes at 160 degrees and that should sterilize it. I know that this question was related to food and cooking, but um, I think the same is true that uh, any application of temperature above that range for 30 minutes will, would destroy the virus. So far, there has not been a confirmed case of COVID being transmitted by a food or food packaging. That doesn't mean it hasn't been. It's probably likely that it has been, but most experts that I'm seeing, the risk is, is fairly slow or fairly low. Um, also, uh, if you're familiar with the, the blog Serious Eats, which you may be if you're a food foodie and, um, and you like to cook, uh, Kenji, I forget his last name, but he is one of the most meticulous um, deep thinkers and researchers that I know of in, in, you know, in, in the world of food and, and food science. And he's done an extensive report on food safety with coronavirus that I highly recommend checking out. Um, it looks like uh, Mary has, uh, thanks Mary for, for putting that link in uh, because it's really, really helpful. Next question is um, from, I, I'm, I'm, we have more questions than we're gonna be able to answer. So I'm gonna to try to choose questions that will be of the, the greatest interest to the uh, largest number of people. Um, Carol said, mentions that I have said that we wanna avoid upregulating ACE2 receptors because that's the, the kind of the doorway for the virus into cells. And we may wanna avoid high doses of vitamin A and D as a result of that. She's wondering about other nutritional strategies um, that might be beneficial while not upregulating ACE2, like melatonin, CDP, choline, probiotics, enzymes, silver, aminoglobulins, essential oils, and beta-glucan. Um, so the reality is we just don't know that much about what we, works and doesn't work. There was a study that came out over the weekend that I talked about in a recent Instagram video update and email uh, that showed that some nutritional compounds like curcumin, uh, quercetin, EGCG, and a few others may uh, inhibit COVID by interfering with uh, viral replication, their protease inhibitors. But that was only a cell culture study and it hasn't been shown in humans. And so we don't know for sure. I think getting those nutrients from food is probably the safest bet at the, at, because we don't wanna find out that you know very high doses of those things actually have a different impact um, than getting them from food. And there are lots of foods that contain those, those nutrients. So that's, that's what I'm suggesting at this point. I also wanna put in a plug for the basics. Um, you know, there's a lot of attention on supplements and herbs and things that can boost immunity, which is appropriate. But uh, I think it's also true that sleep, stress management, you know, the things we've been talking about today, adequate physical activity, not too little and not too much, which can also be a stressor and a nutrient dense anti-inflammatory diet is by far and away going to have a, a, a bigger impact on your immune function. And my concern is that I see people, I think there's a, a number of people who are, you know, really focusing a lot on supplements and herbs and not just doing those basics. So 
please make sure you do get those basics sorted before you worry too much about um, the additional supports. Um, Greg asked, please discuss topic of those of us that believe we've already had it and recovered before it was widely, widely known. Um, I've, I think a, a number of people are probably in that situation. The problem is we just don't know um, because we don't have adequate testing, didn't have adequate testing available then. We don't have adequate serological testing now that can show, you know, antibody response to COVID SARS-2. And um, without really knowing or being certain, it's impossible to say whether it was just a, a, an influenza virus, a different kind of virus, like a rhinovirus or a cold, or whether it was SARS-CoV-2. So this is hopefully an area that will shift as, as, we get, as more testing becomes available. Um, Andrea asked, do devices like Muse 2 work well for mindfulness and meditation, especially people like me who've never done this? Um, I prefer some, some of those devices could be helpful, but I prefer simpler approaches. Um, if you don't have access to a, a teacher or you're not going to, you know, watch videos or learn in that way, uh, apps like Headspace and Calm and 10% Happier, I think are, are a better approach. Um, the Brainwave uh, devices, I, I, I think they can be useful in certain ways, but uh, I, I prefer... Uh, the more traditional learning approach. Um, let's see here, just scrolling down. Dwight asks, what are my thoughts on the David Katz article about more focused striated approach to risk demographics, which seems to have the attention of Washington leadership? Um, there is a growing minority, uh, you know, contrarian view that believes that the measures that we're taking now are, are worse, potentially worse than uh, the, the effects of the virus itself. Um, I, I think they raise several interesting points and I don't disagree that the impacts of the isolation and quarantine are going to be significant. Having said that, I think the cost of inaction and not doing this uh, aggressive early action is likely to be, or at least could potentially be much higher than the cost of action. And I just, and because in the face of uncertainty around that, I don't think we can afford not to act. Uh, so I, I am, at least for now, um, more persuaded by the arguments of epidemiologists and virologists and people who really deeply understand the nature of, of viral pandemics and other pandemics and their, 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 their impacts, because I think, the human brain is not really good at understanding the exponential function. It's, 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 it's kind of foreign to us and we're, we're way more likely to underestimate the impact of something like this than we are to overestimate it in most cases. Um, Mark asks, how can we Americans face the reality of death? It seems there has to be some adapt in accepting or facing death from a spiritual perspective. I could not agree more. Forrest, would you like to speak to that a little bit? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, uh, the contemplation of death has actually been um, a really powerful practice in my life for helping me to, to live in a way where I feel more awake and um, more grateful for all of the breaths that I'm taking, all of the moments that I have. Um, I don't usually share poetry, uh, but I have a very short poem I'd love to share, Chris, if that's... Please. Okay. Please yeah. um, and it's really on point. Um, it's about how death can really help us to wake up and live life more fully. Um, so this is a poem. It's called Of What's Left to Come. Uh, it's a poem that I wrote, Of What's Left to Come. Okay. Contemplate the days. Contemplate the days, not those past, but those yet to come. How many remain? How many remain on this earth, in this body, underneath this sky? What we deny diminishes us. What we deny diminishes us. And as death will come, why not embrace death now as a wise old friend? Let death strip you of your pretense, awaken your humanity, humble you in its mystery. Allow death's inevitability to arouse your secret longing for life and move you to courageous acts of living. 
what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose but the partial death you call life? Don't wait. Don't hesitate. All that we love will die. Dear friends, dear friends, so we're talking to death. Dear friend, please come closer, right? We have such a tendency to push it away. Dear friend, please come closer. Help me to love this life while I still can. Thank you. So yeah, I just we really, we live in a death denying culture. And I think that there's a way that it actually can, can negatively impact our experience of really being alive. Um, and an opportunity um, I'm feeling, I don't know if other people are experiencing this, but in the intensity of these times, I'm also experiencing a greater sense of vividness and aliveness and connection and belonging and the preciousness of life. And so really seeing this as an opportunity to, um, Embrace, embrace death, but in a way that allows us to be more awake and enjoying and appreciating all of our moments. Absolutely, Forrest, I feel the same way. And I think we hear of this from people who've had near-death experiences, um, people who've suffered from a severe chronic illness or had a heart attack, you know, where they, they weren't sure they were gonna make it. Any of these kinds of experience often gives us a new lease on life because as you said, we start to pay more attention to the mundane moments of life. And if you think about it, life really just is a series of mostly mundane moments. You know, we have our extraordinary experiences, things that stand out in our minds, but mostly, most 99% probably of life is one mundane moment to the next. So how we choose to spend those mundane moments really defines and characterizes our experience of life. And I think we're all having uh, being invited to revisit how we spend these mundane moments uh, in this in this experience of of um, COVID. So let's see here. Next question. Uh, I'm just going to mark a couple of these off, and we're going to go for about 15 more minutes. Uh, apologies that we won't be able to get to anywhere near the number the questions that have been asked. Um, but I'm just gonna scroll through here and pick some that are good representation. Uh, Forrest, here's one for a couple for you that I'll, I'll put together. One is um, from, uh, related to whether mindfulness is necessarily a Buddhist tradition. You know, can Christians or people of other faiths practice mindfulness? Um, another is, is um, a breathing question. Is it okay to breathe in and out of the nose during the meditation practice, or do you have to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth? Okay. Yeah, yeah, um, great, great questions. So yeah, re thank you for the question. Um, mindfulness as I teach it and mindfulness, uh, I think a lot of the, the mindfulness apps out there and the mindfulness that's being taught these days um, is secular practice you know, which meaning um, no matter what your religious or spiritual orientation is, or if you don't have any religious or spiritual orientation, these are practices that are backed by science. Uh, there's thousands of research studies at this point um, backing the efficacy of a regular mindfulness practice. Um, so, you know, please know this is not in conflict with, um, for example, if you're Christian, this is not in conflict with uh, being, being a Christian. Um, and this is something that from what I've experienced um, and what I've feedback from students, it can actually uh, contribute to deepening whatever your religious orientation is if you have one. Um, the question about breathing, um, really important. Um, <clears throat> I highly recommend um, breathing practices. Um, I think uh, a little bit of movement before uh, sitting down uh, to meditate, especially if you're feeling some uh, anxiety in the nervous system, is a really beautiful way to begin to calm the nervous system in preparation for a, a meditation practice. Uh, similarly, uh, breathing can be very, very helpful. Simple breathing practice, um, as simple as you know, breathing in for a count of five, uh, there's a gentle pause, and then breathing out for a count of five and just doing a round of five or 10. Um, and then that just really helps to calm the nervous system, begin to calm and quiet the mind, um, relaxing some of the tension in the body and, and prepares us for uh, the deeper 
uh, meditation practice. But yeah, the, you can breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth, or you're welcome to uh, breathe in through the nose and out through the nose. But what I do recommend is when you start your breathing practice, um, come back to just a natural breathing where you're not controlling uh, the, the breath in any way. Thank you, Forrest. So uh, Louise asked a question amidst all these ideas about self-improvement, gratitude, and mindfulness that we can be focusing on right now. Many clients are speaking to me about uh, Louise as an ADAPT certified functional health coach. So many of her clients are speaking to her about being okay with doing nothing sometimes and how to let themselves have that space without guilt. How do we give ourselves permission to strike a balance between growth, personal growth, and giving ourselves some grace? That's a fantastic question. Um, I think the we have a bit of a cultural disease in the West um, where our self-worth is tied to our level of productivity and what we can visibly show for ourselves in the world. Uh, there's nothing wrong with being productive and, and doing things that are, um, uh, you know, doing stuff, let's say that's obviously important, but there's also a place for rest and leisure and doing nothing. Uh, and it's increasingly difficult to do that in today's world uh, with all of the distractions, the technology, social media, smartphones, the internet, and just the demands of day-to-day -day life. Uh, I think it's critical that we give, a, give ourselves that time for reverie, contemplation, stillness, solitude, and just doing nothing without any goal orientation. That's a really important part of our heritage as human beings that we have time like that a book that i've actually really like um, that gets right at this is called rest uh, it's more specific to the subtitles when is when you get more done when you work less so you could argue that there's still a little subtle undercurrent of rest being a strategy for getting more work done but um, the reason i like it is it's a good collection of all of the research on um, rest and uh, you know, many famous people throughout history, for, for example, who made the most creative discoveries in science and um, made some of the biggest contributions to the world were people who knew how to turn off their, their you know, frontal cortex and spend time in nature or just in play or in reverie or contemplation. So um, I found that book is useful because it it's a good doorway for people who are, you know, still oriented um, in that direction. It's, it's, it, I think, gives many people some permission to rest and, and take it easy. All right, um, let's see here. Uh, Jen asks, can you share some tips and perspective on staying abreast of the news while protecting our own mental and emotional state? I'll share what works for me, and then I'd love for any of the panelists to chime in. Um, I'm a big believer in batching use of email and social media and uh, smartphones and technology. So uh, I will just create a couple of distinct periods during the day where I, where I check in on the news and my email and RSS feed and every, all of the places that I get information uh, and keep myself informed and up to date. And outside of those times, um, I, I try not to uh, engage in those things, which creates more space in my routine for focusing on the things that I really want to be focusing on. And then I uh, take a, a tech Sabbath um, one day a week, sometimes two. Uh, right now it's been one uh, because of what's going on for me professionally, everything that's happened. Um, and during that tech Sabbath, I don't really interact with technology at all. I put my phone away, I iPad, don't use a computer. And I just spend time with family and nature um, and just enjoying my experience unmediated by technology. So those are the two things that, that really work well for me. Anybody else? Can I jump in? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, I think that it's really important at this time to stay informed and that's really important and helpful. I think it's um, really unhelpful to, to be overwhelmed. Um, so one of the, I think, essential practices during this time, whether it's, you know, um, our relationship with the media or anything else in our life is 
being able to be in tune and uh, notice the uh, our early uh, warning signs of when we're becoming stressed and overwhelmed and dysregulated. And when you notice that, um, for me, one of my you know core daily practices is when I begin to notice that I'm feeling stressed out or overwhelmed to my number one priority is to bring myself back to a centered place. And we've talked a, a, a many different strategies on this call today on how to do that. But I just wanna really reinforce getting in touch with what your early uh, warning signs are. And if you're watching the news um, to, if you can, um, just hit pause and prioritize bringing yourself back to a more centered and grounded place um, before taking in any, in any more uh, more media. Great. Anybody else want to jump in? Erica? Yeah. Uh, this has been something I've been talking a lot with my clients about right now in particular. And um, some of the strategies that have come up um, that have been, they found helpful and that I found helpful for my, myself are like Chris, I try to try to batch my consumption of, of news media when I can, and especially lately. And I always try to ask myself before I enter into that, you know, hour I give myself to, to get up to date, what is my purpose here? Sort of what am I doing? What do I want to be informed about? So media consumption with a purpose. And like Forrest is saying, using the mindfulness to notice if or when it starts to become overwhelming. Um, because I, I, want, I want to be smart about not just what I'm fueling my body with, but what I'm fueling my mind and my heart with. And sometimes the physiological effects of the way our devices have been consuming us or, or using us, um, it's hard to stay away from. So a lot of my clients have been using an app called Freedom to, um, it actually, you can create block lists of certain types of websites uh, across, and it syncs across your devices and you can set a time, 20 minutes, an hour between these hours so that um, if you really can't keep yourself away, you can start one of those um, block sessions and you cannot turn it off while it's on, it's impossible to do. So that has been a very useful app to change my relationship with apps and news, um, which I know sounds a little backwards, but it works. Um, I just wanted to share that with others as well. Thank you, Erica. Yes, you know, I'm a big proponent of any strategies that can help us and support us in our commitment to create technology free moments. And I think if I reflect on the past 10 years of my life with everything that I've had going on, writing books and launching the ADAPT training programs and running several companies and seeing patients and having a family and all of it, I could not have done any of that and maintained my physical and emotional health without having these technology free periods and, and, and discipline around how I interact with technology. It's the thing that has kept me sane and allowed me to continue to enjoy my life and allowed me to accomplish what I have. I, I, I couldn't have lived without that, frankly. So, um, you know, it's worth, worth the effort that it takes to break some habits and, and get this um, in place in your life. So uh, I, I'm seeing a lot of questions on, you know, various treatments and things of that nature. I'm not going to address those on today's call because I just really wanted to dedicate this to adaptation strategies. We'll have we, are, we had a webinar on, that was more focused on the virus and protection and prevention. And um, we don't know very much about treatment yet, but I will continue to address those things as, as we go forward in my Instagram videos and emails uh, and other social media. And we'll probably have additional webinars as well that are more focused on that. So uh, just time for a couple more questions. Jill asks, what are my thoughts on laughter therapy, laughter yoga, uh, would love some resources. I haven't seen a ton. Of, we, we know that there's a lot of evidence behind laughter uh, and the, the powerful healing effects of laughter. Um, and laughter yoga is actually, or laughter therapy as it's sometimes called, is one way of, um, of bringing more laughter into your life. It can be really hard for some people to do at first. Uh, it was for me. And you have to kind of fake it until you make it sometimes. But 
once you start, it can become really, really fun and infectious, especially if you're doing it with other people. So that's another idea for a group Zoom call would be laughter yoga. Because when you see other people laughing, it triggers our mirror neurons and it makes us laugh. So um, having laughter yoga sessions with other people is really fun. And uh, Robert Rivest is one of the you know, more popular laughter yoga folks. He has a lot of free videos on YouTube and on his website. There are a couple others. If you just go onto YouTube and search for laughter yoga, you'll find a lot of great free resources. Um, lastly, I'm seeing a, a lot of questions about um, adapt health coaches, like how people can find out more about the coaching program or, or work with a health coach, where, they, where can they find directory of health coaches, what is health coaching about, all that stuff. So if you go to CresterInstitute.com, um, which is our main training website, and you click on find a provider, a new tab will open and then you click on find ADAPT certified functional health coaches. Uh, you can also find ADAPT certified uh, functional medicine practitioners there too. So uh, click on that and you'll find a number of uh, coaches that are listed in the directory. Uh, coach need not live next to you. Most health coaching is actually done via video or phone. So that's something important to know. If you see that there isn't anyone in your local town, doesn't, that's not, uh, uh, shouldn't be an obstacle or a stumbling block especially because you're not going to be doing in-person <laughs> coaching, even if it is available probably right now. Um, and if you want to learn more about the ADAPT Health Coach training program, uh, if you just click on that link on the top of the page, um, you can learn more about it. We have uh, graduates from the program that you can speak to uh, and, and get some more detail about the program. We're actually in an enrollment right now for the spring cohort, which is starting um, in late April or, or May. I should know the date, but I don't. It's, it's late April or May, uh, sometime soon this spring. Um, and you know the, the advisors can answer all your questions about coaching and what it's like to become a coach and work with a coach and what the program is like. And then Erica, can you share again your um, Co Coaches Without Borders information? So uh, I've seen some people in the comments who are ADAPT coaches who wanna participate, but maybe didn't get your email or other sure. coaches. Sure. We, um, so if you're interested in, in learning more about the program and want to receive coaching, you can go to healthcoacheswithoutborders.org to uh, enter your information into our mailing list. And while we have been on this call, I think someone has just added at the bottom of that page, if you're a coach interested in becoming involved as a coach, uh, there's an email address there, and I'll say it in a second, that you can email to get in touch with us. And it's info at healthcoacheswithoutborders.org. Great. So I want to thank all of the panelists for um, joining us today and, and sharing your insight and perspective. It was really valuable. I, I know from the comments that everybody got a lot out of your participation. So thank you for for being here, Eric and Erica and Forrest and Lini. I wanna thank everyone who joined us today for participating. Um, I really feel like what we talked about today is just as important, if not more so, than you know all of the nuts and bolts about the virus and prevention and protection. Of course, we need to keep our focus trained there as well. Um, but as I've argued throughout the webinar, we need to balance that out with uh, cultivating more joy and pleasure, laughter, um, building the, the hero, hope, uh, efficacy, resilience, and optimism, and using the five strategies that we talked about in the call to do this. So I'm sending you all my love and gratitude for, for, for being here and for being part of this community, this tribe. And I hope that you and your family stay healthy and well, and that you're able to move through this period with grace and equanimity. And please you know, reach out and let us know how we can support you and help you. Uh, that's what we're here for. And um, yeah, just, just feeling really grateful right now to be part of this community and to have this, this, these resources and the support and to be able to connect with you in this way. So take care everybody, be well. <laughs>